Gases play an important role in nature and technology. How can we describe and understand gases, both macroscopically and microscopically? Welcome to Fiscum Basics. Our topic today will be gases. How can gaseous systems be described? We start with a phase diagram. In this case, a surface in PVT space of a pure substance, our leitmotiv through the lecture series. Where can we find ideal gases here? Ideal gases are those that are at a proper distance from the critical point, that is, at high temperatures and large volumes. Here the phase diagram surface is continuously curved and it can be described very easily, namely by the ideal gas equation. If we move on the PVT surface to real gases, that is gases closer to their critical point, we have deviations from the ideal behavior. Below the critical point, uh, real gases can also be liquefied. In physical chemistry, we often focus on ideal behavior, which is easy to describe. Deviations from this ideal state is then referred to as real and needs some mathematical correction factor. Back to ideal, we zoom out the area of the ideal gas. This area is mathematically very well described by the ideal gas law. P equals RT over V bar. The ideal gas law has a long history. In the 17th century, several scientists did some research on the compressibility of gases. Turned out that gases behave very simply. Doubling the pressure results in a decrease of the volume to half of the initial value. In mathematical terms, P times V is constant. Pressure and volume are inversely proportional. This equation is known as the law of Boyle and Marriott. Compression, more specifically isothermal compression can easily be visualized in the phase diagram. Initial and final state of such a process 1 and 2 lie on, on a hyperbola. The points, the states 3 and 4 also lie on a hyperbola, another hyperbola. These states correspond to an isothermal compression at a higher temperature. What happens when you raise or lower the temperature of a gas? Again, it turned out that gases behave in a very simple way. Double the temperature in kelvins leads to a volume twice as high, with the pressure being held constant. There is a direct proportionality here, formulated by Gellisac's law. And of course, that corresponds to a straight line in the phase diagram. The states 1 and 3, as well as 2 and 4, lie on such isocores. The effect of the amount of substance on the volume is extremely simple, with gases like with any other substance. The larger the amount of substance, the greater the volume. Again, a direct proportionality, with the molar volume being the proportionality factor. It turned out that there was something very special with the molar volume of gases. Unlike with other substances, V bar is in fact the same for each and every gas. This was formulated by Avogadro and his hypothesis. Equal amounts of different gases take up the same volume. For example, at standard conditions, 0 degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals, this molar volume is 22.4 liters. Summarizing these three laws, we end up at the ideal gas law, which is a good mathematical fit of this part of the phase diagram. P equals RT over V bar, or P times V equals N times R times T. R, the ideal gas constant, is the same for all gases. 8.314 Joule per mole and Kelvin. Instead of joules, you can also use liters times kilopascals. The ideal gas law applies to all gases, and it also applies to gas mixtures. 
Air is a well-known gas mixture of primarily nitrogen and oxygen, symbolized here by red and blue dots. Such gas mixture can be characterized by the total pressure, 99 kilopascals. Imagine what happens to the pressure if we removed all but one of the components. We will end up with only the nitrogen particles, which will exert a smaller pressure. This partial pressure, as John Dalton called it, would be 78 kilopascals. Conversely, we can focus on oxygen, remove all gases except for oxygen and end up with a partial pressure of 21 kilopascals. Which, with Dalton's law, which uh, of course derived from the ideal gas law, we can calculate the partial pressure by multiplying the mole fraction of a gas with the total pressure. All partial pressures in a system sum up to the total pressure. By the way, air can also contain water vapor. Depending on humidity, the partial pressure of water in air will be between 0 and 2 kilopascals. Let's take a microscopic look at a gas. Maxwell Boltzmann's kinetic gas theory assumes that gases are small particles that move very quickly. The volume of the particles um, is small compared to the total volume of the gas. They are so far apart that they do not exert forces on each other and the speed of the particles changes constantly depending on how often they collide with other gas particles or with the wall. Based on these premises, Maxwell and Boltzmann were able to explain, for example, temperature. The microscopic phenomenon temperature is simply a measure for the energy of the translational movement of the particles. U sub trans, this is the average kinetic energy of the particles, which is associated with locomotion in space, equals 1.5 times R times T. Any gas at room temperature has the thermal energy of 3.8 kilojoules per mole. Maxwell and Boltzmann also set up an equation for the speed distribution in a gas. Well, you don't have to remember this equation, but the graph is worth that we take a closer look. On the x-axis, the speed of the gas molecules is plotted. It ranges from 0 to 1500 meters per second. The curve is not symmetrical, so we find the average speed somewhat to the right of the maximum. The average velocity, the average speed, depends both on temperature and on molecular weight. The higher the temperature and the smaller the molecular mass, the faster the particle will move. The speed of argon atoms, for example, at room temperature is approximately 400 meters per second. Water, as a lighter particle, has a significantly higher speed at the same temperature. The particles, although they are very fast, ultimately don't get very far because they very, very often collide with other particles. The particles collide with the wall, which explains the macroscopic phenomena of pressure. The frequency of the collisions of a gas molecule with other gas molecules can be calculated by this equation. Sigma is a measure for the bulkiness of a particle and is called reaction cross-section. An argon atom, for example, collides 5 billion times per second with other gas particles, a collision frequency of 5 gigahertz. If we divide the average velocity by this collision frequency, we end up with the so-called mean free path. This important parameter indicates how far a particle travels before it collides with another particle. With argon, this parameter is 400 meters per second divided by 5 gigahertz equals 80 nanometers. That is less than the wavelength of light. The mean free path length depends very much on the pressure, as can be seen from this formula. It's very important for vacuum technology. We remember the premises of kinetic gas theory. 
the particles are very small and exert no attractive forces on each other. This applies in the realm of the ideal gas with both high temperatures and volumes. However, if we cool or compress a gas, eventually the volume of the particles themselves and the forces between them might come into play and a the gas then no longer behaves ideally. Mr. van der Waals has quantified these deviations from ideal behavior. He modified the ideal gas equation and added two correction factors. Factor A is a measure for the attractive forces of the particles. And to account for these forces, you have to add a term with, with A to P. The measured pressure P is less than the ideal pressure. B is a measure of the intrinsic volume and because the ideal volume available to the particles is smaller than the real volume B has to be subtracted from volume. For the ideal gas of course A and B are zero. If we compare the real gases argon and water vapor, water has a much larger factor A as a result of dipole-dipole interactions. There are greater attractive forces in water. However, H2O and argon are about the same size, so there is hardly any difference in B for the two particles. The van der Waals factors A and B can be obtained from the critical values. In fact, gas is only 3 8 ideal at the critical point. P times V equals 3 8 and RT for critical values. Let's discuss some experiments with the PVT service, the phase diagram. First, let's compress a gas above its critical temperature. Methane has a critical temperature far below room temperature, so let's put it in a cylinder at room temperature and reduce the volume. The gas will become continuously denser, the pressure will continuously increase, but nothing else will happen. The system will stay homogeneous throughout the compression process. In the phase diagram, we move along an alpha firm from I, initial state, to F, final state. Now let's repeat this process with the gas below its critical temperature. Let's put butane, critical temperature 425 kelvins, in a cylinder and reduce its volume at room temperature. First, the pressure and density of the system will rise. But as we reach a certain pressure, the particles are so tightly packed that the attractive forces cause the gas to condense. The first liquid drops will form at D. From this point on, we may further reduce the volume, but the pressure will remain constant. The process now is both isothermic and isobaric. Only when all gas has become a liquid, the pressure will rise again. In the state diagram, it looks like that. Starting from I, the pressure rises, then the isotherm intersects the so-called binodal, here the dew point curve, and then the system moves through the two-phase realm on a conode. Both temperature and pressure on this conode are constant, only the volume decreases. Only when we reach the intersection with the other binodal line, it's a boiling point curve, the pressure goes up again to the final state F. One more experiment to show the importance of the critical point. Let's take an empty evacuated container with a volume of 56 milliliters and fill in 18 grams of water, that is one mole. We heat the system to 100 degrees Celsius. What will we get? Well, we'll get two phases, a liquid phase below, a gaseous phase above, and a pressure of 0.1 megapascals. We continue to heat the system to 200 degrees Celsius. What do we have now? A liquid phase below, a gaseous phase above. However, now the liquid phase has become less dense and the gaseous phase more dense. The pressure is 1.6 megapascals now. With increasing temperature, gaseous and liquid phases approximate in terms of density. And not only in terms of density, in terms of every property. 
At some point, namely at 544 kelvins, the pressure is 22 megapascals and then the dividing line between liquid and gas disappears. We have reached the critical point. In the state diagram, we started at I in the two-phase realm and then go up and then hit that critical point. Let's summarize. The state of an ideal gas can be calculated using the ideal gas law. The composition of gas mixtures can be given using Dalton's partial pressures. Microscopically, a gas can be described by maxwell boltzmann theory with the parameters average speed and mean free path being most important. Deviations from the ideal gas behavior can be quantified using the Van der Waals equation, which explains that at the critical point, a gas is only 3 8 ideal. More information about the topic you'll find in the book and in the lecture. Thanks for watching.